Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to celebrate 101 years since the St. Remo Conference. My name is Agnes Imani. I am the newly appointed Chief Administrative Officer at Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights and your host today. As Chaim Weitzman stated, the St. Remo Resolution was the most momentous event in the history of the Jewish people. Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, Imtir II, and the Zionist Organization of America present why educating about Israel's legal rights is more important now than ever. To introduce today's topic, I would like to read an excerpt of an article written by author Diane Biederman. How many times have Jewish students around the world been told that Zionism is a colonialist project and that Jews are white oppressors who ethnically cleanse Palestine of its Muslims? Too many. Our students know about the horror of the Holocaust and have some idea of the millennia of Jew hatred, yet they have no answer when accosted on campus with accusations of Israel being an apartheid state or when facing the BDS campaign with their clarion call to eradicate the Middle East's only Jewish state, which is surrounded by 23 Muslim countries. Sadly, our Jewish students have no response because they have never learned about Israel's legal and historical rights to the land of Israel, Judea and Samaria included. This monumental failure in education has also produced the reality in which so many people and nations question Israel's borders, yet do not question the borders of other countries. The time has come, or better still, it is long overdue to educate students starting in Israel and eventually Jewish and non-Jewish youth and public around the world about Israel's legal rights. Jewish youth worldwide are facing a toxic anti-Israel and anti-Semitic atmosphere on university campuses, including those of the highest reputation, which of late have changed from the marketplace of ideas to the marketplace of venomous, destructive, anti-Jewish incitement. We can only affect change by instilling in future generations the urgent and imperative need to educate themselves with the truth about Israel's foundation. Jewish youth need to learn about the pivotal St. Remo resolution of 1920 that changed the face of the Middle East following World War I and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. With close to 900 registrations to today's webinar, we can affirm the importance of commemorating historic landmarks such as St. Remo. Today, we welcome experts in this field who will discuss the importance of educating about Israel's legal rights. We would like to welcome Mort Klein, President of the Zionist Organization of America, Avi Bell, Israeli Professor of Law, Doug Altabeth, Chairman of the Board of Imtirtsu, Eugene Kontorovich, Professor of Law, and greetings from top government officials. I would also like to welcome our moderators, Goldie Steiner, Founder and Co-Chair of Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, Irving Weisdorf, Co-Chair at Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, Matan Peleg, CEO of Imtirtsu, and Tamir Baram, Content Coordinator at Imtirtsu. We will be hold, holding a Q&A at the end of our webinar, so please submit your questions in the Q&A box. And without further ado, I present Goldie Steiner. everyone and welcome to this educational well, webinar organized by Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights in partnership with Imtir Tzu uh, and collaboration with ZOA. We thank you for joining us in this endeavor. About Imtir Tzu, our Israeli partners, I quote Carmi Gillon, former director of the Shin Bet. It is, in my opinion, the most influential movement in Israel in recent years. ZOA, is laser focused on three goals, defending Israel's legal and historical biblical rights to exist as a Jewish state on all of the land promised by God and by international law. Two, advocating for the unbreachable, eternal and mutually beneficial bond between Israel and the United States of America. Three, and fighting the scourge of despicable antisemitism wherever it occurs. Very special thanks to the three outstanding team workers, Agnes Imani, Tamir Baram, and Eitan Meir, who assisted with every aspect of this webinar. About Canadians for Israel's legal rights, it was co-founded by the late Solomon Ben Zimra and myself in 2009 
at a time when Israel's legal rights despised the ex extensive work of two giants in the field, namely Dr. Jacques Gauthier and Howard Grieve, were all but forgotten or ignored. To fill this vacuum, Solomon has authored a brief and concise book titled The Jewish People's Rights to the Land of Israel, which has been approved by the Israeli legal department and hailed by scores of top level politicians and legal experts. To quote journalist Barbara Kay, this book should be on the reading list of all university courses dealing with the Middle East and the handout at anti-Israel rallies. The book has been translated into Hebrew and taught to thousands of students of Israel's top 15 universities and pre-army high school students by Imtir Tzu as part of one of our joint projects. Solomon has passed away in 2016 on our return flight from a mission to Israel, meeting with then Education Minister Naftali Bennett and other influencers in an effort for the government to incorporate Israel's legal rights into the official education system. Results, you will ask, it is a slow process. We are still climbing Mount Everest. As fortune had it, Irving Weisdorf accepted the co-chairmanship of CILR among his many other commitments. The work before us can only continue with his able participation. Among our many other projects, too many to name here, is debunking the occupation lie, a myth repeated endlessly by our enemies. The world must learn that we, the Jewish people, are the only indigenous people of the land from the river to the sea. I quote Mark Vandermas of Israel Truthwick, we are owners and not occupiers. Being less than realistic, we do not aim too high. In all modesty, our goal is merely to reach the sky. Last but not least, we repeat our plea to the government to declare San Remo a national holiday called Yom San Remo. With this, I invite MK Uzi Dayan to read all or part of the bill he initiated on behalf of our plea, which was read by him in the Knesset. We hope that this effort will continue in the next Knesset and will be brought to his expected positive conclusion. To you, Uzi Dayan. Okay, hi. Hello, Uzi. I don't hear you very well, but I'm with you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can everybody hear Uzi? Hello? Yes, we hear you fine. Yes, it's fine. Oh, there is Matan. Okay, it's my turn. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I made all the way to Natanya to show you something that we do for the Sanremo conference today. Now, the Sanremo conference is maybe the, more, the most unknown conference in Israel. Everybody knows about Balfour uh, uh, Declaration. Almost nobody, especially the young generation, know about uh, uh, Sanremo. And because it's so uh, meaningful to, 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 the, to the Zionist uh, movement, and uh, because it's a kind of a point of no return for uh, uh, the, the new or the rebuilt uh, Jewish state, uh, we decided to go along the line of uh, uh, Judaism. You know, in the Torah, the most uh, common noun is remember. Remember, he said more than everywhere, uh, every other uh, 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 verb in, uh, in uh, uh, Judaism, in Hebrew. But in the Torah, usually remember doesn't stand uh, alone. It goes all the time with uh, keep. Remember and keep, which means uh, uh, that it's not enough to remember but you have to do something active about it. If not, 
you remember, remember, and then you don't remember by the, after some uh, generations. So for that reason, I uh, put a bill uh, uh, in the Knesset, in the Israeli parliament about uh, eight months ago. And, uh, uh, and I, I, I won't read you all the bill, but also only the most important part of it. The most important part of it is what we have to keep, what we have to do with it. It said once in a year, in the time of the, we, we took the Hebrew calendar, which is the first day of ER, uh, when the conference began 101 uh, years ago, and uh, we say the government will mark the commemoration day in a weekly meeting. Then the Knesset will convene a special discussion in the Knesset plenum uh, and the education and cultural committee will discuss it too. Uh, the day uh, will also be uh, uh, the government, there will be a special government meeting and at the same time, the president of Israel will make some event about it. The, uh, the Defense Forces of Israel, the Chief of Staff, will uh, publish a special remark about uh, uh, this day. And the educational system in Israel will learn it, will discuss it, will derive the lessons and the consequences of uh, uh, this event. Now, if we want really to keep it, it's not enough. And what we did here, you can see, let's show you behind my back, you see this uh, square circle. Uh, in a few hours, uh, actually in uh, two hours, uh, the mayor of Netanya, the city of Netanya will come here, uh, Miriam Feinberg uh, Ikar. And together we are going to give the name of uh, uh, San Remo uh, at this uh, square. You can see it also here. It's a part of it in Hebrew and uh, uh, English. But uh, 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 the idea is to see here the preparation <laughs> and the square that will be called a, a San Remo Square. And here, little by little, every time, we will have some event of calling a street or calling a circle, a square, or do a special event like the event that you are leading. And uh, I, I think that you are doing great here. And in, uh, here in, in our uh, place in Israel and the Middle East, it will have a very important um, a contribution to understand that Israel is not only strong, but also right by the uh, uh, international uh, uh, legal uh, uh, rights. And uh, this uh, country, this land uh, belong uh, to us. So uh, uh, thank you very much for everything that uh, you are doing about it. And thank you uh, thank very much to Im uh, Tirzu and other people have contributed to it. And uh, as we say uh, in our place, Nizkor Benishmor, Zachor Veshamor, which is stand for uh, remember and uh, keep in one speech. Thank you very much. Toda Rabba. Toda Rabba to you, Uzi. You like wine, you don't need praises. You're well known and we appreciate all that you do for us, for Am Yisrael and for Yom San Remo, which is very important to us. And now I call on Galit Param, Consul General of Toronto and Western Canada, a highly esteemed friend of the community to bring greetings from the government of Israel, which will be followed by recorded messages from Danny Danone former permanent representative of the Un United Nations and currently serves as chairman of World Likud. And if I may add, a cherished friend of mine. 
MK Yariv Levin, former Minister of Internal Security and Minister to be in the next <laughs> government. Simcha Rotman is an Israeli lawyer and a member of the 24th Knesset, a member of the next Knesset. He is the author of a timely and important book, <laughs> The Ruling Party of Bagats, How <laughs> Israel Became a Legalocracy. Hello, hello all, Boker Torbi Toronto. Good morning from Toronto. I'm very honored to uh, not only to bring greetings, but to speak uh, uh, after a member of Knesset, uh, Uzi Dayan, uh, bring greetings on uh, behalf of the government of Israel. Uh, these days we're marking uh, 101 years to the San Remo Conference, which laid the foundations and paved the path to the founding of the State of Israel. It will take a few years after uh, the conference, of course, but the importance of the conference lies in the fact that it bridges the gap uh, between general statements of uh, support, uh, general sympathy, recognition of the need of the Jewish people in general, and between the adoption of a concrete uh, legal steps, and this is a fundamental difference. For the first time, the unbreakable bond between the people of Israel and the land of Israel uh, was internationally recognized and acknowledged after 2000 years of exile um, <clears throat> and the beginning of a settlement uh, in the land of Israel. We, of course, the Jewish people, we didn't need a reminder. Uh, this is pretty much in our blood, in our education, uh, in, in our prayers for 2000 years, uh, but the international community definitely needed uh, this uh, recognition, this acknowledgement uh, and this realization. The State of Israel has done a lot to educate and teach about the San Remo uh, conference um, in, in conducting programs, in convening conferences, in providing information. I agree that more should be done, more could be done, especially when it comes to young people uh, in uh, Israel and in the diaspora. It has to do with the changing times. It has to do with the fact that uh, so many young people rely on social media and draw their information from different sources, but definitely there is a responsibility to the state of Israel, the education system, and by the way, parents and educators to provide information about the uh, San Remo conference and the fundamental uh, role it plays in the history of Zionism and the history of the state of Israel. I would like to thank uh, Canadians for Israel's legal rights, the ZOA and Intel too, for taking the initiative and organizing this event and for providing information and bringing up over and over again, the San Remo uh, conference. I would like to mention two people in particular. One of them is Dr. Jacques Gauthier for his uh, amazing research, uh, thorough uh, research that was established about the San Remo conference that creates such a wonderful, professional legal basis for discussions. And uh, I would like to particularly thank to Goldie Steiner, a dear friend uh, for their tremendous work and for their commitment. Um, I'm, I'm upon completing five, a five year term here in uh, Canada in the summer, in about two months, I'll be heading back to Israel. And um, it's a good opportunity to mention here that Goldie Steiner and Dr. Jacques Gauthier our dear friends of the consulate, we meet very often uh, for conversations, for, for honest discussions, not only about the San Remo conference, but about fighting anti-Semitism, about the connection between Israel and the diaspora and the importance of education. And uh, I, I can't thank enough Goldie Steiner and of course, Dr. Jacques Gauthier for their commitment, for their tremendous work. During these uh, times of uh, COVID, events are uh, COVID. Uh, we events are held online, and um, uh, we diplomats we very much miss uh, in-person uh, meetings. We don't get to do that anymore. It's been a year and a half of uh, challenging times uh, for Canadians, for Israelis, for people all over the world. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a great opportunity here in the uh, online activity. Uh, to hear straight from excellent Israeli speakers. And a uh, member of Knesset, uh, Uzi Dayan, is only one of them. There is a very long list of people who will speak here today, provide information, and, um, and present uh, the Israeli aspect, uh, the vision of uh, San Remo. Uh, geography is no longer a barrier. I think this is a wonderful thing, uh, thanks to the wonders of technology. I wish you all 
uh, fruitful discussions today. This is an important event. More such events should be organized. More information about the San Remo Conference, this important chapter uh, in uh, the, the history of Zionism, the history of the State of Israel, more importance must be provided. I thank you all for including me in this program, and I wish you all in these troubled times good health. I can promise you from what is happening in Israel that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gali. Thank you for being a friend to the community, particularly to myself, and for always being available to pretty much everyone that was active and wanted to, the diaspora supporters of Israel. You have been outstanding all through your tenure. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure, and we'll miss you, Valit. And now our first panelist, Mort Klein. He's president of the Zionist Organizations of America, named one of the top dozen Jewish activists in the last century, and named one of the top Jewish leaders in America. Mort, as the foremost Zionist voice in America, please inform the audience why educating about Israel's rights to the land is more important now than ever. Please comment on the following. The rise of anti-Semitism, the toxic atmosphere on campuses, the failure of education, including in Israel, and what can we do about all of the above? You, Mort. <laughs> Well, thank you, Goldie. Um, first of all, I have to warn everybody, I, uh, I have what's known as Tourette syndrome. I make sounds sometimes I can't control. You should understand that uh, you might hear those sounds. I've had it since age five, uh, but thank God my wife decided to marry me anyway. Uh, <laughs> so I'd like to thank Goldie and everyone who worked so hard to put together this very important conference that <clears throat> people rarely hear about or know about uh, this important topic. <laughs> It's important to educate decision makers, the public, our own people, children, rabbis, even Jewish leaders <clears throat> about Israel's legal rights to the land of Israel. Few people, including Jews, know about the San Remo Conference, but they do know about the lies that are perpetrated about uh, Jewish occupation. <laughs> the Canadian Jewish News article said it very well. It was entitled The Forgotten History of What the Jews Gained at the San Remo Conference, making it clear that all the land of Israel was established legally in 1920. That's in force to this very day. In fact, Secretary of State Michael Pompeo uh, released a, a statement uh, very recently. The historic San Remo Agreement marks the world's embrace of the unbreakable connection of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, an enduring constant from the time of the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the reigns of Kings David and Solomon and throughout the subsequent period of exile and dispersion, that Secretary of State uh, Pompeo. Too many people <laughs> believe the ubiquitous propaganda lies demonizing Israelis as colonialist human rights violators and illegal uh, occupiers. These lies are propagated by some even Jewish politicians, leaders, and rabbis. Yes, it's true. <laughs> the lie that Israel illegally occupies Palestinian Arab land and that Jews have no right to, to the land. This is the key falsehood at the heart of the increasing global efforts to delegitimize Israel, justify anti-Israel policies and legislation, and praising Israel into making suicidal condition, conditions. Remember, the word occupation would mean means this word that Israel has stolen someone else's sovereign land. But Judea and Samaria were never Arab sovereign land. <laughs> Jordan illegally occupied Judea and Samaria from 48 to 67. Yet major BDS websites declare up front, Israel is occupying and colonizing Palestinian land. <laughs> and we have a recent horrific UN resolution 2334 that was orchestrated by the Obama administration in collaboration with the Palestinian Authority, <laughs> adopted in 2016. This resolution falsely declares that the establishment by Israel of settlements uh, in the Palestinian territory occupied since 67, including East Jerusalem, has no legal validity, says this phony resolution, uh, and constitutes a, a flagrant violation under international law. They're saying the Temple Mount, the Western Wall, the Jewish Quarter, Hadassah Hospital, Hebrew University, are all on Arab occupied land. It's unbelievable. Uh, uh, they also demand that all settlement act activities in the, in the occupied Palestinian territories stop 
and they call for nations to distinguish between the territory of the state of Israel and the territories occupied since 67. This is essentially a call for all nations to boycott Jews living or working over the Green Line. <laughs> We've had violent Palestinian Arab days of rage, anti-Semitic college campus actions that are led by SJP Students for Justice in Palestine and all sorts of demonstrations. During these days of rage, they chant such things as no border, no building on stolen land from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Other chants include occupation of Palestine is a crime, free Palestine <laughs> uh, and such. Even though the truth is that the Palestine was never a country, <laughs> it's a region. There were never any Palestinian kings or queens or Palestinian currency. Palestine was simply an area, a desolate backwater in the Ottoman Empire for 400 years before the Ottoman Turks lost World War I. <laughs> Palestine is not even an Arab name. It's a Roman name. How can this be Arab land if it has a Roman name? Because the Romans, after they captured Judea and Samaria, they renamed this area Philistinia after the Philistines to stick it to the Jews. These were the Jewish enemies. The Philistines were not Arabs. <laughs> Moreover, until the 60s, when Yasser Arafat co-opted the name Palestine for his PLO terror organization, the whole world knew that the word Palestinian until the late 60s meant Jew, that Palestine was the Jewish homeland. The Israeli newspaper, now known as the Jerusalem Post, was called the Palestine Post. The Jewish Orchestra, the Palestine Orchestra. The American movement to reestablish the Jewish state was called the American League for a Free Palestine. In the movie, Exodus in 1960, the Jewish hero Ari Ben Kanan, played by Paul Newman, he says, I am a Sabra. That means a native born Palestinian, because everyone knew that meant he's a Jew. The antidote to falsehoods is to proudly and repeatedly proclaim the truth. The best weapon we have against the lies that Israel occupies Arab land is to teach the truth and to spread the truth that we have the historic, religious, moral, just, and legal and political right under binding international law to the land of Israel as decided and promoted and established in the San Remo conference in 1920. The truth is the best tool we have to strengthen our children against the tsunami of lies that they will encounter in their college campuses. These lies are being spread at younger ages in biased ethnic studies programs in high schools, middle schools, and even elementary schools. ZOA has been battling against many of these biased ethnic studies programs. In California, we succeeded in, uh, in taking some of the worst statements out of the state approved program. Now the anti-Israel groups are trying to reinsert these terrible lies. We must teach our children the truth. Our Torah says, Vishinantam Levonecha, teach them to your children. The truth is totally on our side, but the lies are working and they're hurting us. <laughs> Unfortunately, instead of telling the truth, Many in the Jewish community are helping spread the lies, yes, or using approaches that don't address the problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is no occupation at all. It doesn't exist. Israel has given up Gaza and relinquished control of 40% of Judea and Samaria. That's where 99% of the Palestinian Arabs live under their own rule, except for security. There's no occupation, no matter how you define it. Another mistake that many Jewish organizations make is to claim that everything is merely a narrative and they treat both sides' narratives as equally valid. But the Arab valid, uh, narrative is a lie. We should not give credence to it. <laughs> we are in a court of public opinion. We're pointing to all the great things Israel has done, doesn't answer the lies. Many Israelis and Jews think, let's talk to people about the wonderful things we do. That will help them support us. If someone repeatedly hears that the Jews stole Arab land, it doesn't matter to Israel that we Israel won 10 Nobel Prizes or that we help Africans or Haitians. <laughs> they still think that Israel stole the land. So these uh, arguments don't work. We have to directly teach them the history of our thousands of years of presence on the land and the San Rebo uh, legal resolutions and other documents affirming our legal rights to the land. By the way, <laughs> we should also tell the truth and demonize the demons of the Palestinian Authority, <laughs> that it is a terrorist dictatorship, which pays Arabs to murder Jews, which names schools and streets and sports teams after Jew killers, which promotes violence in their schools, their sermons, speeches, and media, while refusing to negotiate with Israel for over 10 years. <laughs> 
And then <laughs> there's the counterproductive appeasement and blame Israel approach, epitomized by the influential Reut, R-E-U-T, ADL report distributed to Jewish groups. This was touted as offering expert advice how to counter it. But in fact, instead of countering it, <laughs> they blame the attacks on Israel because of the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. They blame the Israel rabbinate. They blame the Knesset and administration for the propaganda assaults against the Jewish state. <laughs> the ADL report justified and portrayed delegitimization assaults against Israel as reactions to quote, genuine injustices that require a change, a lie. <laughs> the mistreatment of the indigenous population, the Arab citizens of Israel, a lie. The reaction to Israel's military campaigns in Gaza, and Israel's perceived lack of commitment to a two-state solution. <laughs> in other words, the ADL report said that Israel deserves to be legitimized. We must expose this and condemn Reut and ADL for putting out such nonsense, such lies that hurt us. <laughs> they made no effort, this report, to correct the glaring falsehoods used to justify delegitimization. For example, the report didn't explain that Jews, that we are the indigenous people of Israel. <laughs> that Jews were a majority of the population in Jerusalem since the mid 1800s, that the Jewish people has international legal rights to Israel, Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, that Israelis, Arab citizens receive equal rights, that the Palestinian Arabs have repeatedly rejected extraordinary offers by promise Prime Minister Ehud Barak and Ehud Olmert, where they were offered 95 to 99% of the land and they wouldn't even make a counter offer and they went into a terror war. We have to let people know this. Unfortunately, too many groups have adopted mistaken approaches. A few years ago, the ZOA was invited to send a representative to a meeting of 25 major American Jewish groups to discuss what our organizations do to combat BDS. The ZOA showed up with booklets that we give it on college campuses called the myth of occupation, called Israel does not occupy Arab land. ZOA's representative spoke <clears throat> that how the key is the truth, how we need to emphasize that Israel is lawfully our land and at every opportunity while showing that the PA has no interest in peace. We show them <laughs> this type of uh, uh, poster, uh, if you can see it. This is the official poster of the Palestinian Authority. It shows all of Israel, all of it, with the kafia over all of it, a picture of Arafat, the terrorist in the middle, and a, a Kalishnikov rifle. This proves ex com ex completely the Arabs have no interest in having peace with the Jewish people. We have to show these types of documents wherever we go, but I never hear anyone doing it except for the ZOA. Mm -hmm. Incredibly, other groups at this conference <clears throat> said that occupation is a problem. They promote that this is true when it's not true. So how do we promote the truth that effectively and persuasively counters these anti-Israel lies? <laughs> we must repeat the truth at every opportunity in pamphlets, in our speeches, in our press releases, in online learning events like this one, in articles and newspapers, in our missions uh, to Israel. Uh, we must educate Congress, testimony before congressional committees, and our letters to stop anti-Israel legislation and regulations. Uh, a few weeks ago, six Jewish anti-Israel organizations led by J Street wrote a letter to the Secretary of Homeland Security saying that products that are made in Judea and Samaria must not be labeled made in Israel, but must be labeled made in the West Bank and Gaza. We wrote to the Secretary of Homeland Security and had 31 Jewish groups sign it as why this would be an outrageous falsehood. <laughs> that the label West Bank is insulting, historically inaccurate, overwhelmingly opposed, and wrongly ignores that Israel has a lawful right to these territories under international law. We need more organizations doing this. Where's APAC, AJ Committee, ADL, B'nai B'rith, they must be fighting for this publicly. <laughs> Jews have lived in Judea and Samaria since ancient times. <laughs> These territories never legally belong to Jordan. <laughs> the, the areas were moreover known as Judea and Samaria for thousands of years. UN Resolution 181 passed in 1947, never used the term West Bank. It used the term Samaria and Judea. Shortly after Jordan began its 19 year illegal occupation in 1948, <laughs> It began to use the word the West Bank in order to de-Judaize these areas and lie that Jews were never here. In 2019, I'm happy to say the World Zionist Congress, an elected body representing Jews from throughout the world, enacted a ZOA resolution to end the use of the term West Bank. It's a phony term. This is Yehuda and Shamron. <laughs> Most significantly, 
requiring the label West Bank for products from Judea and Samaria and prohibiting products from those areas to be labeled produced in Israel ignores that e Israel has the right to these areas under San Remo resolution, the Balfour Declaration, UN Charter, uh, uh, Article 80, and other legal documents. We must state this wherever and whenever we can. Another recent example of how we fight is our press release and op-eds recently enumerating, correcting, and demanding that the publisher fix numerous anti-Israel lies about Israel's history and legal rights written by President Obama's recent book, strangely called The Promised Land. <laughs> we also make our voice heard when distortions of Jewish history appear in the arts. For instance, we wrote articles and press releases, gave numerous speeches, and helped organize huge protests to the Metropolitan Opera's production of Death at Klinghoffer, which had lies and lies about Israel's rights to the land and Israel's treatment of Arabs. <laughs> My detailed congressional testimony promoting moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem a few weeks before President Trump announced that he would do so <laughs> included a discussion of the Jewish people's 3,000 plus year history in Jerusalem, plus the binding international law that gives us the rights to, in Jerusalem and Israel. During my testimony, I explained, and almost no Jews will say this, we must say this, that Jerusalem is the Jewish people's holiest city and that it is mentioned 700 times in the Hebrew Bible. This is where we direct our prayers for millennia. By contrast, Jerusalem is not holy to Muslims. It's never mentioned a single time in the Quran. They direct their prayers to Mecca and Medina, not Jerusalem. Throughout the Ottoman Empire and during the 19 years from 4867, when Jordan captured and illegally occupied Jerusalem, including the Jewish quarter, the Arabs treated Jerusalem like a backwater slum. They paid no attention to it. They don't care about Jerusalem except to take it away from us when we control it. Similarly, my congressional testimony promoting US recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the Golan described the Jewish people's history in the Golan stemming from biblical times, the 38 ancient synagogues found in the Golan, the Jewish land purchases and farms operating in the Golan, in the late 1800s, and the fact that this was included in the original mandate. <laughs> when anti-Israel groups falsely argue that UN Resolution 181 requires Israel to be divided into an Arab state and the Jewish state, and for Jerusalem to be an international city, we point out that UN Resolution was a recommendation, not law, not, and it wasn't accepted by the Arabs, who instead went to war to destroy Israel. When anti-Israel groups falsely argue that UN Resolution 242 requires Israel to withdraw from all territory that Israel recaptured in 1967, we point out that the resolution called for Israel to first have secure and recognized boundaries it does not require Israel to withdraw from all territories. In fact, Israel is withdrawn from 90% of those territories, including the Sinai, thereby more than satisfying Resolution 242. Don't let them use this against us. When anti-Israel groups falsely argue that the UN resolutions require Israel withdrawals, other ones, we have to point out that the UN Charter's affirmation of the Jewish people's continuing rights to the land makes all future UN resolutions that attempt to remove the Jewish people's rights absolutely void. I recently co-authored a chapter with ZOA official Liz Burney about the impact of the Trump administration. We made sure to insert the historic background information about US presidents and treaties, treaties affirming Israel's rights to its land. We also encourage the use of accurate term, terminology. We must use the term Shadeh and Samaria and phrases such as land over which Israel has a sovereign right under binding international law. Do not use annexation. You don't annex your own land. We, as part of our ongoing sovereignty campaign, we issue with a declaration called 13 Reasons ZOA strongly supports Israel restoring her rightful sovereignty over Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley. It's available on the internet. Reason number one is entitled Israeli sovereignty fulfills international law. Reason number two is entitled no legal impediments and demonstrates these the Jewish people's legal rights to these territories have never been uh, abrogated. In other words, we take every opportunity to correct falsehoods and promote the truth while exposing and this is also important, the Palestinian Authority's complete lack of interest in peace. <laughs> the fact is that they wouldn't accept deals when Israel gave the PA almost all of Judea and Samaria, proves the PA war against Israel is not about land anyway. Land is not the issue. They've been offered almost all the land, they said no. It is about Israel's destruction. That's their goal, that's why they wouldn't accept unbelievable deals offered by Barack and offered by uh, Ehud Olmert. <laughs> There's of course much, much more we need to do. 
One of the many projects we're working on now is alternative curriculums uh, uh, in Jewish schools, at least to uh, talk about these truths. In closing, I'd like to urge all of us to work together on promoting the Jewish people's rights to our homeland. This is already happening. Uh, 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 we have other Jewish groups often signing on to our letters. We must be promoting the truth of the Arab war against Israel. It's not an Arab-Israeli conflict. It's an Arab war against Israel and Israel's existence. We often now work together on projects and protests. We need to do more of this. If we stand together, we will remain strong and we will succeed in ensuring our people's just rights. The legal truth, the religious truth, the historic truth, the political truths are all on Israel's side. Let's always proudly proclaim all of these truths everywhere, uh, uh, wherever we can, in every form that we can. Thank you so very, very much. Allow me to interject here for a moment. We, we will be showing the, uh, uh, some videos of important messages from the government of Israel. Uh, it will follow, uh, what will follow is uh, Danny Danon, former permanent representative to the UN and currently serves as chairman of World mm -hmm. and if I may add, a cherished friend of mine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> M.K. Yariv Levin, former Minister of Internal Security and Minister to be in the next government. Simcha Rotman is an Israeli lawyer and a member of the 24th Knesset and member of the next Knesset. He is the author of a timely and important book, The Ruling Party of Bagats, How Israel Became a Legalocracy. And before showing the tapes, Mort, I want to thank you. And all I can say is, is that we have a lot of work to do together. Etan, please show the recordings. Shalom to all my friends. I would like to thank Im Su and Canadians for Israel's legal rights and my dear friends from VOA for putting together this important event. It is essential to speak about our past in order to secure our future. It is important to speak about the San Remo Conference, which codified our international rights to the land of Israel. I want to thank Maud Klein, who told me 30 years ago that we have to learn our history in order to secure the future of the state of Israel. I wish that soon we can meet you all here in Israel, and together we will continue to protect our homeland. I would like to congratulate Im Tirzu together with Canadians for Israel's legal rights and the Zionist Organization of America for holding this important event in commemoration of the 101st anniversary of the San Remo Conference, the historic event that codified the Jewish people's rights to the land of Israel into international law. I have no doubt that thanks to your work, the Jewish people in Israel and around the world will have a better understanding of the historic significance of the conference and its implications today. I am pleased to be sending you my blessings for this important event. Thank you, and I urge you to continue your influential work for the sake of the Jewish people in their homeland. The Torah says, When the Most High gives to the nations their inheritance, and separated the children of men, he set the borders of the people according to the number of the children. I think uh, uh, 101 years of the declaration, the decision about the, the, the right of the Jewish people to the homeland, I think it's a, it's a perfect example. The world was a mess after World War I. And even talking about power, talking about borders, talking about areas um, uh, um, influenced by the most powerful nation in the world. What they're speaking and talking about is the right of the Jewish people to their homeland and how to help those help after a few years in the United Nations and the UN and 
received from the beginning of the organization were supposed to settle the world together or were busy with the idea of the Jewish people should have their own land. 101 years after, we still have to debate this issue. We should most people, most nations around the world, do not need to justify their own existence in their own land every time, time and again. But we see that we need to be continued. And I want to thank Intel Zoom, I want to thank Canadian for Israel, Legal Rights, and COA for bringing up this event with them. I hope for many, many more years we'll talk and celebrate this event. I hope in, in years to come, it will become more of a celebration and less of a declaration because the declaration will be already clear for everyone here and also everyone around the world. Thank you for attending and I'm sorry I can't uh, participate in real time, but it's a great event and thank you all the organizers. Shalom to all my friends. I would like to thank Impu Tzu and Canadians for Israel's legal rights and my dear friend from VOA for putting together this important event. It is essential. Irving, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, first, I'd, I'd like to also thank Mort Klein for his inspiring remarks and also Mort for your incredible leadership over so many years. No one has spoken out more clearly or more consistently or more truthfully than have you uh, about the rights of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. Uh, you've become an icon in the Jewish community. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Avi Bell is a member of the faculties of law at both Bar Ilan University and the University of San Diego. Avi also serves as a senior fellow at the Kohelet Forum, uh, the Kohelet Policy Forum. Avi, I'd like to ask you to explain to our audience the history and significance of the San Remo Conference in the Jewish people's struggle for our homeland and why it is more important now than ever. I watched the presentation that you gave a year ago on our 100th anniversary celebration of San Remo. I was surprised that at the end of the presentation, you, a professor of law, made the point that while we must know and teach how international law is on our side, we cannot merely count on the law to protect our homeland. You stress the importance of also being militarily ready. Uh, and today I invite you as well to comment on the other facet of the war against Israel, the public relations war in the press and in the social media, and how careful we must be not to fall into the trap of adopting the terminology of the enemy. We need to recognize that the creation after 1967 of the myth of a Palestinian people was superbly clever PR, uh, done by the Soviets and their post-war Nazi propagandists. And we must be exceedingly careful not to absentmindedly use the term Palestinian as if such a people exists. It is the Palestinian Arabs who exist. But for the most part, these are members of the same tribes as the Arabs who live in the Kingdom of Jordan, the Palestinian Arab state created in 1922 in the first partition of Palestine. Avi, the floor is yours. Uh, but you'll thank have- Thank you, yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Irving. Uh, uh, thanks for the kind introduction and for, uh, for the questions you posed to me. Uh, thank you to the conference organizers for inviting me and thanks to the hundreds who are watching this webinar. It's a great pleasure to be here. Now, I'm gonna try in the short time at my disposal to explain very briefly why the San Remo Conference and its decisions were historically important and why it's worth paying attention to them today. And Irving, feel free to uh, interrupt me and redirect me as you need to. Um, as we know, in the, uh, in the 19th century, the, uh, the Jewish people were scattered throughout the world. There was no uh, uh, um, uh, state of Israel. 
the ancient homeland of Israel was ruled by the Ottoman Empire, and it, which uh, it placed severe restrictions on its Jewish population. It was against this background uh, that those who called for reestablishing the Jewish Commonwealth in the ancient Jew Jewish land of Israel, like Theodore Herzl, were considered to be dreamers. Uh, today, we find ourselves in a quite different position. We're in the 73rd year of the state of Israel's reestablished independence, Israel's home to the world's largest Jewish community. Uh, the Jewish population of Israel is greater than at any time in history, even in times of than it was in the times of Joshua, of Solomon, of the uh, first and second temples in Jerusalem. Now, the key event in all of this, in this transition um, from where we were then to where we are now, is of course the Israeli War of Independence, in which a newly established Israeli government uh, was able to uh, um, impose its authority over the land of Israel and hold off invading armies from half a dozen Arab states, as well as uh, uh, three Palestinian Arab militias who had all vowed together uh, to massacre Israel's Jewish inhabitants. Now, um, but to get to that point, to get to the point where Israel was able to um, use its newly established army to um, fight for and maintain its uh, desired independence, um, there was a long road, and um, the, the, the road, in part, was the road of the Mandate of Palestine. Now, the Ottoman Empire lost control of the land of Israel in, during World War I in 1917, uh, but it was not a Jewish army that conquered the land of Israel in 1917. It was a British one. Now, the Brits um, could have incorporated the land into the British Empire. That's not what they did. In 1917, they promised to establish a Jewish homeland in Israel. They'd called it, of course, Palestine. Um, and they carried this promise with them um, to the post-war conferences that uh, um, all the victorious allies held um, in order to uh, uh, determine what would happen with the various lands that had been uh, occupied by the armies during World War I. Um, the Allied armies decided, the Allied countries decided Versailles that the imperial lands of the Ottoman Empire as well as Austro-Hungary um, and uh, uh, Germany would be turned into so-called mandates, lands held in trust, trust for specified peoples um, um, who would enjoy what Woodrow Wilson called a right of self-determination. This was the first time such a right had been recognized in international law. According to the Charter of the League of Nations, the mandates um, would be created by decisions of the allied powers with the approval of the League of Nations under terms to be established by the, the League of Nations. So when the British carried their promise, the Balfour Declaration, and took it with them to San Remo, where they met with the other principal allied powers, and those allied powers agreed to award a mandate in Palestine to the, Brit the, the, the British Empire, um, charging them specifically with carrying out the Balfour Declaration. And when two years later, the League of Nations convened in Geneva and approved that mandate um, and a charter for a mandate that ordered the British to reestablish the ancient Jewish homeland in Palestine to facilitate the acquisition of citizenship by Jews, to facilitate their immigration, to facilitate their close settlement on the land, to cooperate with a Jewish agency in the governing of the land, um, and otherwise to carry out the terms of all mandates in creating self-determination for the specified peoples, in this case, the Jewish people, um, the, um, uh, the League of Nations, the countries of the world and international law awarded uh, the Jews with the rights that Herzl had dreamed about, they awarded them with um, a right of self-determination to lead to a state um, that was exactly what was considered to be an impossible dream um, only so several short decades earlier. Now, the mandate was not exactly uh, and not quite what we wanted. It did not explicitly promise this state. Uh, as we know, the British never fulfilled all of their promises. They violated uh, international law by, among other things, uh, and most devastatingly, um, blocking Jewish immigration, 
at exactly the time when it was most needed in 1939, where the British essentially handed the fate over all of European Jewry to the evil empire of Adolf Hitler. But the mandate was an, an indispensable bridge between the dreams and the reality of an independence. It was the framework in which Jews could buy land, immigrate to, to the land of Israel, eventually build an army and hold off um, the enemies who sought to massacre the Jewish people and deny them independence. Um, the mandate awarded at San Remo um, created a legal right of self-determination for the Jewish people. The Jews, of course, already had um, historical and moral rights, the rights of justice, but there are many in this world, I think wrongly, but many who, who equate the demands of justice and morality with the doctrines of international law. There are those who look to international law to determine what they view as moral rather than the other way around. And for those people, it is important that we emphasize, that we show that in fact, the Jewish people obtained and never relinquished a legal right of self-determination um, 100 years ago, a little bit over 100 years ago, that uh, um, uh, stays with us until today. Now, this is a right of self-determination. The, the, the San Remo and uh, the uh, League of Nations approval of the mandate did not establish the state of Israel. They did not establish the boundaries of the state of Israel. Those were done by the operation of, of Israel. Israel establishing its independence, uh, creating the facts on the ground, and then according to the doctrines of international law, succeeding to the territory of, of the mandate. But uh, the mandate was important in establishing uh, self-determination. And there are those ironically who today insist that rather than use the, the, the rules of international law, the independence of uh, the state of Israel and its control over uh, territory, a population through a government that has the capacity to carry on foreign relations, they say, let us look at what peoples have a right of self-determination and what lands they claim. And in fact, among these are the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, who, as we all know, has announced plans to bring discriminatory and legally baseless charges against Israelis for uh, uh, alleged crimes. The, the prosecutor, with the approval now of a pretrial chamber of the, the, the court, says, don't look at the doctrines of international law about boundaries and states. Instead, look at self-determination. Well, if that's what the way that uh, um, these actors are going to act, let's remind them who has the prior and stronger claim of self-determination over these lands. And it is that, for that reason, and for so many others, that it is important not to forget to remember what was established at San Remo. Can you hear me? I do indeed. Thank you, Avi, for this powerful message. Um, I myself learned a lot about the conference that I wasn't aware of. Um, excuse me. We'll now move on to our next speaker. Um, I would like to uh, introduce to you Douglas Altabeth. Doug is chairman of the board of Intertzu. He also serves as a board member of the Israel Independence Fund and is an avid Israel advocate in Israel and in sorry, English language media. Now, Doug, it's good to have you here. I have a few questions for you. Great. Um, great. The first one is, are there any non-legal implications to the San Remo conference that add to its importance? Uh, sure. Um... Am I uh, seen here? First of all, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. And um, I, I particularly want to thank the organizers, the three uh, organizations that have worked closely together to make this happen. And uh, the 30 organizations that agreed to co-sponsor uh, the, the event. T Tamir, is am I missing something? I'm a small box, you're a large box. Should that be reversed? 
So that just so that people can see me uh, as I speak. No, you're great, Doug. Oh, is that right? Okay, terrific. Um, I don't know that I'm great. My wife would disagree, but but thank you for the uh, for the input. In any event, let's let's look at two very uh, relevant considerations, non legal considerations having to do with San Remo. One is the historical validation. Uh, Avi talked about uh, the dream of Theodore Herzl. Theodore Herzl was like, in many respects, like a Moshe Rabbeinu of modern times. And what I mean by that is what he had in common with uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was that both of them grew up in the palace. Uh, and they came from a background that allowed them to see the world from a very different perspective from the vast majority of their co-religionists uh, of their people. In the case of Herzl, he was a well-to-do, assimilated, professional Western European Jew. And his whole approach was to approach the nations of the world as if he were the leader of a shadow government uh, of the Jewish people. And his approach was to say, we are a nation and we want to be considered as yet another nation. Deal with us, not as a downtrodden, benighted, oppressed people, deal with us as a nation who is seeking to return to its ancestral homeland. And while San Remo is often uh, thought of as the codification of the Balfour Declaration, I would submit that it is also the validation of the Herzlian approach, the Herzlian vision to have the nations of the world see the Jews as a nation worthy of being treated as yet another uh, nation to be in our case. I think that was a very powerful uh, fact for a lot of Jews, seeing the, the victorious powers of the world, the allied powers coming together as a group. Remember, this is pre-Holocaust. There's no guilt here. This is something that was felt to be appropriate, to be right. And implicit in, in the approach was Herzl's point to world leaders that this will be good for us as the Jews as a nation, and it will be good for you, our European hosts, since you have seemingly uh, a lot of problems, societal problems, having Jews among you. Uh, give us our own nation, we will be uh, equals, we will be peers, and, and that is one of the implicit messages of San Remo. The other the other non-legal consideration I would point to is one that, that Mort was alluding to, and that is the stories that we tell about ourselves. San Remo becomes a very important piece of the puzzle, a, a very important milestone in, in the narrative. And I don't mean that in the narrative sense that Mort said everyone makes up a story about themselves, but I mean the historical narrative of the return of the Jewish people to their land. That narrative begins in ancient times, in historical biblical times, has a very long hiatus, and then starts to resume in the middle of the 19th century. It resumes with early Zionist writers such as Moshe Hess. It resumes with early Zionist organizations such as Hovavet Sion. It resumes with the remarkable, remarkable, miraculous resuscitation of Hebrew as a vernacular language led by Eliezer ben Yehuda. And it proceeds to Balfour, and then it proceeds to San Remo. So San Remo becomes yet another uh, stone along the path to the return of the Jews to national sovereignty. And I think in that sense, uh, it has been a source of great comfort. It was a source of great comfort to people at the time, to Jews around the world. And as we are, the reason why we are here today is to make sure it is not forgotten. Thank you, Uzi Dayan, for your efforts to make sure that 
uh, as San Remo is being kept front and center before us, should never be forgotten. It is an important part of the saga that has resulted in the miracle of modern day Israel. Thank you, Doug. I couldn't agree more. And I like the fact that you mentioned that, you know, this was before the Holocaust. So both sides found their interests and both sides, you know, did not feel any guilt surrounding really the merit on the, uh, the Jewish people's right to the land. Um, now, in this respect, um, Canadians for Israel's legal rights and Im Tirtzu, they have a strong partnership when it comes to education. And obviously that has a lot to do with remembering San Remo. Could you elaborate on what our partnership looks like? Sure, we have a long and a very fruitful relationship with Goldie Irving and their team at the CIL CILR. Um, I'm very proud to say that, that education is, is a critical part of Imtir Tzu's mission, education of our citizens, education of our students. And so uh, Goldie came to the right place when she thought to team up with us several years ago. Together, we have done many conferences, conferences with A-list speakers, speakers such as Ayelet Sheked, speakers such as uh, Avi Dichter, Amit Sigal, uh, generals, uh, journalists, A-list speakers. We've done a lot of speeches together to pre-army mechinot, uh, pre-army academies of of very, very talented young people getting ready to go into the army. We've done a number of uh, videos that have gone viral uh, talking about Israel's legal rights. We've, uh, and, and very importantly, we put out a booklet together digesting the recommendations and the findings of the Levy Report, a very important commission, which in 2012 issued a report saying that Israel cannot be deemed to be an occupier in any legal sense of the word. Uh, our experience in Judea and Samaria is adverse, uh, at variance rather, with the historical experience of occupation. So we have done any number of things together, and I look forward to our continuing that, that important collaboration together. Thank you for that. And my last question, please, is how do you view, how do you view, sorry, education today? And what do you think are our biggest challenges in that area? I view education distressingly. Uh, it is a shock for me to say that education as a, uh, as a means for sustaining civilization has become an endangered species in the West. We, uh, I grew up in a world where education was all about how to think, to learn how to think. Today, education is increasingly becoming uh, about what to think. And this is very frightening. Uh, and I think that uh, the uphill battle that Mort alluded to, the, the challenges that uh, really have uh, gone into conferences like that speak to the need to educate in the sense of providing objective truth. Truth has become an endangered term. Um, I would say just uh, that uh, not only is this increasingly true from what I understand in the United States, uh, you know, uh, Natan Sharansky was famously asked just recently, uh, what do you think the chances are of the US becoming totalitarian? And he said, greater than ever. And he bases this on his experience on American college campuses, where people are afraid to speak their mind. They're afraid to express their conviction. And, and in this regard, I want to uh, give a shout out to the ZOA because uh, it's an organization that we at MTIR2 are proud of collaborating with, of working with, and they are increasingly becoming the last man standing, which is shocking to say on behalf of uh, organizations, Jewish organizations supporting the state of Israel, but they are becoming an endangered minority there as well. And we need to support them and their efforts. Um, so 
education is critical. What we see in the workplace now in many places in the United States are uh, mandatory woke training, mandatory diversity training, mandatory white supremacy training, where you have these so-called facilitators who are sitting in on meetings just the way KGB agents sat in and Gestapo agents and Stasi agents sat in to make sure that the meeting goes the right way. This is very frightening. It's very, very frightening. I would say the situation here in Israel is a little bit different. And that's partly because the structure of higher education is different here. Not that we don't have wildly uh, anti-Zionist professors, we do, and I'll allude to more of that in a minute, but the student body in Israel is different from the student body in America. It's largely post-army, it's largely older, it is largely uh, non-residential. And so the student body here is not necessarily as susceptible to buying into ideas of demonization of Israel, uh, the demonization of Israeli rights, the disparagement of our connection to the land. And, and so we have uh, some, some greater strength to fall back on. A very important part of the mission of Im Tier Tzu, of course, is to strengthen the Zionist backbone of our citizens, of our students. And uh, one of the resources that we have done to do that has been the creation of a very popular website called Know Your Professor, which is a compilation of, at this point, more than 100 Israeli academics who have taken steps to do things like boy, uh, signing petitions to boycott Israeli universities, signing letters to the European <clears throat> Parliament or uh, to various uh, European governmental bodies to, to boycott Israel, uh, to charge Israel with crimes against humanity or, or war crimes. And, and our feeling is our students need to know who they are potentially dealing with. This is a caveat emptor, buyer beware type of uh, resource. We're not calling for the firing of professors. We're calling for our students to understand that if you're going to take a class, with Professor so-and-so, you might know, you must know that he or she might attempt to browbeat you into a narrative that will include the demonization, the disparagement, the delegitimization of Israel and Israel's legal rights. So education becomes very important. Look, bottom line, I can love Israel, I can care about Israel, but if I'm being confronted with someone who is saying things like you're a usurper, you're an interloper, you're an occupier, I need to have meat on the bones of reality. I need to know history. I need to know truth. I need to know facts. And that's what uh, CILR is all about. That is what Im Chir Tzu is about. That's what the ZOA is about. We want our supporters not just to have Israel in their heart, but Israel's rights in their mind, in their brain, on the tip of their tongue. So listen, let me just finish by thanking everyone for coming out today. We've had a wonderful turnout and, and I hope we go, as they say, from strength to strength and do many more of these going forward. Thank you, Tamir. Thank you, Doug. Um, Matan, the stage is yours. So first and foremost, uh, shalom to you all. And uh, Goldie, now I think it's the time to thank you from all the people that are in this uh, conference. God bless you. Thank you. Your energy is inspiring us every day and every minute. God bless you. And thank you for everything. And also, Thank, for, thank you for Agnes and Irving, and uh, that I'm sure that also uh, get from your uh, energy. And so we all, we are more than uh, 400 people, almost 450 people in, in this uh, event. And I think we all salute you, Goldie. Thank you very much. Uh, may I say just one word, Matan? All we're asking for is 
whatever we do is to get some support for diaspora NGOs. We're working very hard. Israel is in our hearts. And especially help us get uh, connected with the, the Jewish Agency for Israel, who are training uh, and sending delegates, a large numbers of young people to the diaspora. And they're branding Israel. They're doing a wonderful work, but we want them to do more and train those groups that they're sending to the diaspora in to train them to learn about Israel's legal rights, of which they have very scant knowledge. Thank you, Matan, for everything and, and for being. God bless you, Goldie. Uh, so, and of course, thank you, Tamir and uh, Doug. Um, I will, uh, my question is to uh, Eugene Kantorovich, a professor uh, at uh, George Mason University, Scalia Law School, a true fighter for Israel, uh, legal rights, um, someone that is a specialist in uh, international law and a great defender of Israel. And uh, it is my honor to ask you uh, to talk a little bit about the issue of indigenous people as we all know intuitively, uh, the Israelites, the Jewish people, it's not, not only ha have the historical rights to Israel, but we were born in the land of Israel. The culture is coming from here. This is what we are. Uh, this land is ours and it breathed from us and uh, also in the other direction. But there is a very big attempt in the world uh, to uh, erase this uh, memory and try to penetrate the doubt in every one of us that we will feel not very strong in uh, this uh, belief and this um, fact that we are uh, those in the people of Israel, the, the indigenous people. So we will be very happy if you will um, help us and expand a little bit on this uh, issue. Please, Eugene, thank you. <coughs> Thank you. So, um, in part because of the um, intellectual current of anti-colonialism and post-colonial post -colonial thought, uh, a great value is placed on uh, people being an indigenous people. Uh, and uh, it's seen as according extraordinary legitimacy. Of course, in fact, uh, pretty much everyone everywhere today uh, got there as a result of uh, population migrations and indigenous peoples throughout the non-Western world had displaced pr other previous indigenous peoples. Um, and this is not a legal criteria, endogeneity. Uh, one can have national rights um, separate from being a, an indigenous people. For example, um, the current population of the United States um, is uh, legitimately uh, the voting uh, population of the United States legitimately, you know, the United States legitimately belongs to the people of the United States, despite the fact that the people of the United States cannot be described as indigenous in the sense that that word is um, typically used. But in this regard, uh, the, San Re so this, um, the San Remo Convention is important because, of course, the Jewish people know that they are indigenous. Um, before they went back to Israel, the entire world also knew that the Jewish people were indigenous because before the return to Israel, um, when Jews were in exile, uh, they were often told by uh, the peoples in, amongst whom they lived, you're not from here, go away, go back. Only when the Jews went back that they were told, you, you, you can't go there either. Um, so you, you, you can't stay, but you, uh, you can't go. The, but the League of Nations mandate specifically speaks about the reconstitution in Palestine of a Jewish national home, the reconstituting a national home in Palestine. That means that the reason the League of Nations chose uh, Palestine to be the Jewish national home is not because they didn't think anybody else was there. They knew there was an Arab population. It's not because... Um, uh, it was convenient. It was not particularly convenient. Uh, it didn't have an economic base and there were many other difficulties. It's because this is where the Jews were from. And who thought that this is where the Jews were from? All the countries in the world. That is to say, the Jews were not being given something they never had before. 
they were uh, being given another chance, a return to their national uh, to, to their national home, which means a hundred years ago at least, the entire national international community knew the Jews were from Palestine. The Jews were from Eretz Israel, and even though I think uh, the League of Nations mandate does not have much legal relevance today, aside from establishing the borders of Israel, which is very important, but the particular the particular language is, is less relevant. As a historical document that shows 100 years ago, the entire international community accepted that Jews were from Israel, which means they have all the rights of indigenous peoples. It didn't address the question of whether there could be another indigenous people. That's entirely possible, theoretically. But what's clear is that Jews are unindigenous people, and they're not an indigenous people of within the 1967 borders. They're not an indigenous people of Tel Aviv. They're an indigenous people of the entire land of Israel. When, um, when you see the, the propaganda in uh, universities, also inside Israel and out of Israel, uh, about this issue. Um, what are the five fast sentences that you uh, are like, shoot very fast um, to answer those people? And I'm asking it because like this, you will provide us, the people mm -hmm. that are in this conference, uh, ammunition for a fast drawing. And later on, we will expand and maybe we'll have the information that you have. We will work hard. Um, so I, I think the indigenous issue is actually not so important. It's almost not worth answering because uh, as I said, um, there is no concept in modern politics or uh, law that the indigenous people have special claims. For example, the United States, Canada, they're not inhabited by, uh, they're not governed by, they're not primarily inhabited by the indigenous people, but nonetheless, uh, their existence and sovereignty is um, undisputed. But, uh, but I think there's a sentimental appeal. There's a sentimental appeal of indigeneity, which is why, in particular, the Palestinians make a big deal. They, they go to great lengths, right? Jesus was a Palestinian is one of the most absurd arguments. It's, it's laughable. Uh, there were no Arabs at all at the time when Jesus was born, let alone Palestinians, you know, 600 years before the Arab invasions. Um, but so it's laughable and it's um, but it shows how, at least with some people, this question of indigeneity has some great uh, emotional uh, resonance. But I think it's very important, important to point out that unless uh, unless one thinks that the non-indigenous people of the United States, which means everybody who is not a member of a uh, native tribe, 99% uh, of the population should leave or um, somehow be punished, then this question of indigeneity doesn't matter. But nonetheless, even if, and if one thinks that there's something really special in indigeneity, then of course, every major document from the Bible to San Remo has recognized Jews as the uh, indigenous people. Okay, thank you, Eugene. Uh, hey, my okay, pleasure. Now it's uh, your turn. Thank you, uh, Matan and Eugene and uh, all the panelists. Uh, we will now move on to our Q&A section of the program. So we had uh, some excellent questions. Um, we had to just select a few because we don't have too much time for our Q&A. Now this is directed to any of the panelists who would like to answer. Here's question one. Our fight for the recognition of Israel as the internationally legal sovereign owners for the territory from Jordan to Mediterranean is undermined by the Oslo Accords. How can this be rectified? The Israeli government has never, to my knowledge, openly educated world leaders and Israeli citizens about the historical facts. Why is this as it also undermines our efforts to communicate the historical truth? So it's a two-part question. Uh, who would like to answer this? Mort? Uh, Please go ahead, Mort. Mort, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you. Go okay. ahead, Mort. 
maybe after I speak, you'll wish I was remained on you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, look, the Azo Accords were the one of the worst policies a, a government ever perpetrated on their people. We fought against it from day one. We were called extremists and warmongers when we spoke against it. <laughs> but in fact, what it did is it gave away 85% of Gaza and Jericho. That's it. <laughs> did not give away any part of Judea and Samaria, <laughs> any part of Jerusalem, and even 15% of Gaza wasn't given away initially. Later, with the Gaza uh, withdrawal, uh, Sharon gave away the rest of it. <laughs> so you should understand the Oslo agreements uh, do not uh, have anything to do with Israel's right to keep uh, all of Judea and Samaria, uh, all of Jerusalem. Uh, it ju it's just not so. Uh, <laughs> even though Israel has given autonomy to the Palestinian Authority in 40% of Judea and Samaria, and that is where almost all of the Arabs live. And that's why even no matter how you define occupation, there is no occupation because the Arabs are live, the Palestinian Arabs are living under their own rule in Judea and Samaria and in Gaza. The 60% of Judea and Samaria that remains under Israeli rule uh, completely, uh, there are very few Arabs who live there. And even uh, the communities of Judea and Samaria, uh, they only, the Jewish communities only comprise two and a half to 3% of Judea and Samaria. So this is one of the big lies that we have to keep saying. There is no occupation, no matter what, uh, even beyond the legal definitions. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Uh, so uh, Oslo, even though it was a terrible mistake, did not uh, preclude Israel uh, uh, asking for sovereignty over the rest of the territory. Thank you, Mort. Uh, Avi, would you like to elaborate on that? I, I just like to add something very briefly, um, and I hope uh, I'll, I'll preface it the way Mort did, which is I hope it's not going to be unpopular here. But let's understand that there's a big difference between what uh, um, a government has to do and what we have to do as uh, as individuals. Um, the job of of the government is actually to do things on the ground. Um, we have it. We have a state. Um, we have independence. It's not the job of the state of Israel to justify itself. It's the job of the state of Israel to exercise its government, to exercise its authority, to hold on to our land, to defend us and secure us. It is our job as individuals to make sure that everybody out there understands our rights. The, now, I, I will say and it's fair enough that the Israeli government has at times done the opposite of, of educating. It's, it's been miseducating. Um, it's sometimes denied um, our rights, and that's that's simply inexcusable. Um, but the big the burden of education is on all of us, and it's why why it's so important for all of the people who are listening today, who are watching this, to know that they are they have to carry this burden. Right, you you are the ones who have to carry the burden of of educating people about our rights. Thank you, Avi. Tamir, would you like to ask the next question? Yes, thank you. Um, again, this is a question for any panelist. Um, so how basically is modern anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism connected, if they are? And how are they to be fought, whether separately, together, if someone can would like to elaborate on that? I'll start. Um, Anti-Zionism, pe people uh, have asked me in course of travels to the States, well, you know, if I criticize the state of Israel, does that make me anti-Zionist? And the answer to that, of course, is uh, no. Uh, and, and the follow-up question is, well, does that is anti-Zionism uh, anti-Semitism. And the answer to that is, let's look at what anti-Zionism really means. If anti-Zionism is applying a double standard to Israel, in other words, uh, the, the Chinese are oppressing the Uyghurs, uh, but that's, you know, okay, they're a great power, and there are all sorts of uh, conflicts over territory around the world, well, that's okay. But somehow, when 80 plus percent of the resolutions at the UN and at uh, the UNHRC 
are all directed at Israel, there's a profound double standard being exercised. And that means that uh, this is not just criticism of the Israeli government. This is the old trope that, you know, the, the Jews are not like you and I, and, and they're not to be regarded in the same way. So that double standard issue is a very, very key part of what trips up uh, criticism, makes it anti-Zionism, makes anti-Zionism akin to anti-Semitism. Thank you, Doug. Yes, yeah. more. Uh, I'd like to add to Doug's uh, excellent point. <laughs> if someone is against the Jewish state of Israel's existence, <laughs> they clearly hate Jews. <laughs> because uh, if I were against Italy's existence or France's existence, you would understand I must hate Italians and I must hate the French. So when you say Israel shouldn't exist, this is clearly enmity and hatred of Jewish people. When you say the country shouldn't exist, you simply criticize a policy. <laughs> That's legitimate, but it's also interesting. You don't hear any of these people criticizing Israeli policies, <laughs> criticize uh, uh, French policies, Italian policies, Spanish policies, Mexican policies. They ignore all that. They only, most of the people criticizing Israeli policies are doing so because they can't stand that there's a Jewish state. And so uh, uh, for those two reasons, uh, uh, when you oppose Zionism and when you have harsh, inappropriate criticism of Israel, when you're ignoring other far worse uh, uh, countries' uh, policies, it's clearly uh, uh, hatred uh, uh, of the Jewish people. And I hate to say, you know, uh, when, when, when people say, you know, well, you know, Israel's not perfect. Well, no human being's perfect. No country's perfect. But the only country we talk about not being perfect is Israel. We never say Italy or France or Spain or, uh, or, or even China is not perfect, only Israel. This is hostility toward Jewish people. There's no other explanation. Add something for it. Thank you. Uzi, would you like to say something? Very short. It's very easy. There are very easy standards here. If somebody uh, <laughs> criticizes the <laughs> Israel <laughs> policy again and again, and doesn't say a word about Syria is, and this is anti-Semitism. It's, it's in a new court, etc. But uh, seeing people in some places criticizing or demonstrating against Israel, they don't, and they don't have anything to say about Syria, about other countries in the storm, about uh, Iran, it means that they hate Israel. And hating Israel is hating the Jewish uh, land, the Jewish uh, country. Yes, I might add, it's more, <laughs> at, the, at the J Street anti-Israel conference last week, Senator Warren and Senator Sanders were condemning Israel and condemning Netanyahu, but not a word of condemnation of Mahmoud Abbas, who's paying Arabs to murder Jews, who, who uh, uh, promotes violence in every aspect of his culture, who names school streets and sport teams after Jew killers. No criticism of Abbas. So when you're condemning Bibi, <laughs> really for mild problem issues and, and ignoring Abbas's, you hate Jews. And that's Sanders and that's Warren. There's no other explanation. I agree with Uzi Dayan completely. Thank you. Thank you, Mortz. Um, and thank you, Uzi. Our next question. What can students do on campus to use the momentum of the peace agreements to combat BDS? And will normalization affect BDS? Again, this is for uh, any panelists who would like to answer. Any takers? Yeah, you know, one of the, uh, one of the most amazing things is that uh, in the wake of the Abraham Accords, we had uh, Emiratis come to uh, Israel, toured around. You had Emiratis went up to the Temple Mount. This is a fascinating story. I don't know how many people realize this. And uh, what happened to them? They were pelted with rocks and insults by Palestinians and the Jordanian Waqf. And they were basically run off uh, the Temple Mount. And the upshot of it was 
that they announced, now we understand why Jews are upset about their treatment on Harabayat, on the Temple Mount, because we, we experienced it firsthand ourselves. So why do I mention this? Because there is the opportunity today for, you know, politics makes for some strange bedfellows. We now have new allies, potential allies with the Emiratis who genuinely want to uh, have peace, trade, opportunities to invest, tourism with Israel. And the opportunities to take that reality to places in the diaspora and to show, you know what, uh, Israel is not opposed to Arabs. Israel seeks ties with Arab countries. And this is a very powerful point. And I think it's one that will be getting much more visibility going forward. And one which I think groups like the ZOA uh, should also be employing uh, to make the point which uh, needs to be made, which is we are all about, we are the most peace loving people on earth. Okay. But we are addicted to the idea that we should be uh, taking a, a powder, as it were, we should be going away in the name of other people's ideas of what's right or what's appropriate. We're going to be sticking to our guns, but we're going to be sticking them to them with our hands outstretched at every at every moment. Um, it's more. Uh, I would say to these students, why aren't you promoting BDS against countries which have really astonishing human rights abuses? The Palestinian Authority, Sudan, China, Russia, Iran, and many others. It shows that there's uh, this is an unfair attack on Israel. <laughs> we also should be condemning J Street and Peace Now, both of whom not only support BDS from anything made in Yehuda and Shamron and Eastern Jerusalem, but they bring the leaders of BDS to their conferences. We should be fighting to tell every Hillel and every organization umbrella organization like the JCRCs that has J Street or Peace Now on their boards as members, that if they're supporting BDS in Judea and Samaria or bringing in pro-BDS speakers, they should be thrown off of those boards and as members from the Hillels and JCRs around the country, that has not happened. And a powerful uh, 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 statement to be made to these students when they do BDS because they say you know, they want a Palestinian state solution. You notice I don't say two state solution. Israel's already a state. This is a great misnomer, two state solution. Israel's a state already. Anyone who supports a Palestinian state, it should be called a Palestinian state solution. <laughs> well, we tell these students that Ehud Olmert and Ehud Barak have offered 95 to 99% of Judea and Samaria and Eastern Jerusalem to the Arabs, horrifyingly. <laughs> and that so they've already offered virtually everything they could ever imagine, hope for and one, and they turned it down each time, we tell these students. Not only turned it down, they started a terror war and started murdering Jews when this was offered. When I asked Ehud Omer, as I tell students, why did Abbas not accept your breathtaking, astonishing, really egregious offer? He says, Abbas said, I, I will not sign a document that says I accept Israel as a Jewish state, and Abbas said to Omer, and I will not accept you saying, I'm not allowed to have the right of return to bring millions of Arabs into Israel. What more proof do you need that the issue is not land, is not uh, 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 peace. The issue is Israel's existence. We explain that to students and they're astonished because they never heard of any of these things. Thank you, Mort. Can I ask another question? Go ahead, Tamir. Okay, um, this one I think should go to Avi. Avi, if you will. Um, the, these are, this is kind of like a sum up of a few questions that I've seen in the Q&A chat. Um, so it seems like the, and a few of us uh, have already touched on it, but I would like you to kind of try and summarize the, the problem here. Um, because a lot of us were mentioning the the conflict, you know, and how um, there's a double uh, double standard towards Israel. Um, and so basically, the question is um, is that we can see that the international public opinion really excuses its destructive obsession uh, with the Jewish state by arguing that Israel exists on the expense of the lives of Arabs, you know, that it's occupying and so forth. How would you um, drain? 
you know, how would you refute this claim, first of all, and what would you respond, you know, uh, what would be your answer in maybe a sentence or two? Uh, the, the basic point that uh, uh, we have to make, and I, I do again want to make a distinction between the things that governments have to say and do and the things that individuals have to say and do. Our point is always that uh, we are not in Israel um, by, uh, by grace of some human agency. We're there by right. Um, we're, we're there because it's our moral right. We're there because it's our historical right. And for those who believe in it, they were there because it's a, a right granted to us by God uh, 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 millennia ago. Um, all those things are the basis of our rights, not, uh, not human agency. Um, it's not, and nobody's given us a favor by doing it. And by the way, nobody gives anybody else any favors either. Uh, states are not created by votes in international organizations. They are created by facts in the ground. They are created by groups of people establishing a government over territory where a population lives, right? That is how states, are, and that's, that's what, what, uh, um, what we have to do. Now, the, the question then is, how does one break through with this message, right? How does one um, get through to, uh, let's say, large populations in Europe, which uh, see things uh, differently, who, who believe that, in fact, uh, um, um, the Jewish people and the Jewish people acting in a national capacity are simply evil, and the answer is there's not very much that you can do to persuade them because their beliefs are not rational. Um, what you can do is make light of their beliefs, ridicule their beliefs, show, show them otherwise, so that um, those who are, you know, who are children in an environment where the adults are all telling them nonsense can grow up and learn actually something different. But this brings me back to the, the question that was asked about the Abraham Accords. The most important thing that can be done, most important thing that can be done is to actually go above their heads, for the governments to go above their heads, for the government of Israel to act confidently in um, um, acting in its interest on the basis of a presumed understanding of the Jewish people's rights and never apologize and never look back. Thank you. Agnes? Thank you, Tamir. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Okay, does the Israeli government have the right to give away land that Jews have given up, um, sorry, that Jews have given up their lives for, land that has, has historically belonged to Jews for centuries, or is this something that should be voted on by the population? Is this open or may it's I? It's an open question to any panelist. Okay. Avi? Um, yeah, there, there is a law in Israel that uh, any land uh, to which Israel's applied its law and administration, which the, the, uh, the government wants to surrender for whatever reason, um, has to either uh, go before a, a national referendum for approval or uh, be approved by a supermajority of the parliament. And I think that makes perfect sense. Um, it is a decision, it is up to the Jewish people to decide what they want to surrender under what circumstances. And um, nobody should ever tell people that they can't compromise. But at the same, same time, um, uh, it is up to the Jewish people. And so um, they are guaranteed the right uh, to participate in the democratic process of deciding whether this is what they want to do or not. Thank you, Avi. Uzi, go ahead. Please answer the question as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe the right person to, to answer such a, <laughs> such a question because I was, uh, on one hand, the head of the, all the negotiating, the security committees in all the negotiations of Israel with the Palestinians, with the Syrians, with the uh, Jordanians, and actually with others. And at the same time, uh, I was... Uh, well, about 30, 36 years in the army and I, I was in the IDF and uh, I was uh, injured three times. So and being in a special unit in the Israeli, in the Israeli special unit, something like the Delta Force, but much better, of course. Uh, I 
so I, I, I got injured three times. So once in, his, is in, his, in an Israeli kibbutz um, against uh, terrorists who took over uh, kindergarten and we freed the, the kids and I was injured. One, another time was in uh, somewhere in Syria, I don't want to say exactly where, and, uh, and the third time in uh, Lebanon. So in, my blood is in Israel, in Syria, and in Lebanon, and uh, I don't think that uh, somebody has to make a rule or a law about it. It's the people who have to decide uh, about uh, the land of Israel. I have my opinion, everybody has its own opinion. And being a democratic and lawful uh, country, this is the way to decide on such issues and not uh, just by, I don't know, just by stating a law or a rule uh, about it. Thank um, you. It's more. Yes, it's more. <laughs> <laughs> Crystal, this question implies that this Arab war against Israel is about land. <laughs> we have to understand it's not about land. It's about Israel's existence. The, the agreements, the, the concessions that uh, uh, Olmert and Barak offered virtually all of Judea and Samaria, even part of Israel, and they rejected it, proves it's not about land. The fact that their emblem that I showed before shows all of Israel with an Arab kafi over it. This is the Palestinian Arab emblem shows it's not about land. They believe it's all theirs. <laughs> the fact that we've given away uh, Gaza and 40% uh, uh, of Judea and Samaria, autonomy at least, and it, it's not brought us any closer to peace, uh, shows again, it's not about uh, uh, land. So this is uh, what, uh, what we have to really make clear to students and people that the Arab war against Israel is not about land. They've been offered all the land they could ever have wanted in these negotiations. <laughs> And they refused it. Plus, they refused to negotiate for 10 years. If it's about land, they want a deal. Why aren't they negotiating? I would recommend to these students and people to read certain books which will explain this to them. Robert Spencer's The Palestinian Delusion, The Catastrophic History of the Middle East Peace Process, Kenneth Levin's The Oslo Syndrome, Delusions of a People Under Siege, Shmuel Katz's Battleground, Fact and Fancy in Palestine, and Menachem Begin's The Revolt. <laughs> and also go on our website, zoa.org, you'll learn and understand that the Arab war against Israel is not about land. So no matter what we offer, it won't work under these circumstances. It's about Israel's existence. And I, I want to add the, another some sentences, is it okay? Yes, go yes. ahead, please. <laughs> okay, when we negotiated the peace with Syria, after two weeks, I went to Yitzhak Rabin to light it. Been and said, look, they are not going, uh, nothing uh, will, will come out of this uh, negotiation. And uh, in the same time, he asked me to host a co the, the, most, the, the most important uh, committee of the, uh, of the Senate, of the capital uh, uh, in Israel. The most important one is, of course, the finance, finance committee. And I took them over to uh, Mount Hermon and other places in the Golan Heights and explained to them that if we make, if we give some land and we make a peace with uh, Syria, and as I said, uh, it wasn't the case, but I explained to them and uh, explaining what, what, what we need and what uh, can replace in some places. Uh, uh, etc. Now, uh, afternoon, in late in the afternoon, we're sitting in a place called Kalat Namrud, when you can see the Golan Heights on one, uh, uh, in front of us, and the right hand, we can see the Hula in the north part of Israel, left man, Mount Hermon, and uh, Lebanon. Uh, it's, it's, we're living in a small neighborhood. And the uh, um, and, and they asked some, somebody, a member of this uh, uh, committee, asked the chairman there whether he can, the head of the committee, whether he can say something. Uh, they say, okay, and, uh, and he presented himself and he say, I'm a Nitros Campbell. Do you know this uh, person? He was a senator, he was named Nitros Campbell. 
and he say I'm a native uh, American and um, and he said it was a very it, it was a wonderful um, a, a day now we understand the, almost everything I have never seen such a good presentation about uh, the Golanites and the Israel and Syria a, a, a potential agreement. And, uh, and then he say, but if you want a small piece of advice for me, uh, representing the Native Americans, he said, never trade land for peace. <laughs> The American was very embarrassed, the Israelis were jiggling, and <laughs> etc. And I still remember Night was Campbell. I saw him one day on his motorcycle in Washington. And I, 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 I still remember his small piece of advice, never trade land for peace. Thank you, Uzi. So this concludes our Q&A section. Um, I would like to call on Irving for closing remarks. Thank you, Agnes. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, it's been wonderful. I'm pleased to tell you that we have uh, over 800 participants in the webinar. I'd invite everyone going forward to share thoughts that you have heard today uh, with a few friends, because that's how we're going to spread the word. And let's hope that Uzi Dayan's motion to recognize San, Yom San Remo is passed by the next Knesset. Uh, it's a very, very important uh, motion because uh, it will spark questions. What is Yom San Remo? And then we can start or continue the educational process. Our webinar agenda will continue to mark special occasions. The next webinar will be held on July 24th, uh, put it in your calendars. Uh, we will be celebrating the mandate for Palestine. Anyone who is interested in our continued activities and anyone who wishes to obtain a copy of Solomon Ben Zimra's book, The Jewish People's Rights to the Land of Israel, please see the information at the bottom of the screen, which I see uh, Eitan has uh, projected. So you can uh, email uh, Agnes, uh, now that you know her, uh, at israelslegalrights.org or Goldie at israelslegalrights.org. It should be R-I-G-H-T-S uh, in both those email addresses. I must not fail uh, to mention that we are looking for champions. I invite anyone who feels they can help us to contact, contact us at the addresses that were just shown on the screen below. Now it's my great pleasure uh, to close our seminar uh, to call on Joyce Aldrich, who will share her beautiful voice in singing Hatikva. Again, thank you all for attending. Joyce. Joyce, I'm gonna ask you to please unmute. You're still muted. My kids ask if they can sing also. <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> you know, they're going to put on a shirt, but they're going to share it on. Perfect. Go ahead, Joyce. Please join me in singing oh. that Tikva, the hope. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We will have a recording made available for everyone who has registered for the webinar. Thank Great. you, Agnes. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank, Thank you, everybody. you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you, Irving, Agnes, Goldie. Irving, Irving Mort, Avi, Eugene. Yeah. <laughs> 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 